There was a time in the scriptures where Jesus was starting his earthly ministry. And there was a time where he was needing to go someplace. And his disciples told him, you don't need to go through Samaria. And Jesus said, I have to go through Samaria. Not that I want to. There's a divine call. There's a purpose dwelt within my soul that I have a need. That I have to go minister to a person that is broken to a point that she, or we could say he, needs me. There's some, some heartfelt issues. There's some needs within our life. And the brokenness of our life is exactly the time where God will put a divine purpose within our soul and a divine calling upon someone's life to meet that need. Ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. Divine needs. When we are to a point where we feel that there's no other hope, when we feel that I'm destitute and I'm struggling and I'm hurting and I have no hope in the future, God supernaturally, every time, Bring someone upon your life that can meet that heartfelt need to bring joy within your soul. The struggles that we have is sometimes we feel so inadequate. Sometimes we feel so depressed that we don't look for opportunities to minister and to care. But when God's resources, through his loving kindness, through his people, can look out and reach out and find people that are hurting and struggling and we can give God ministry. In John chapter 4, verses 39 through 42, we just watched the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. She meets Jesus, and now she says, I am not known by my past, but I'm known by my faith. She went into the city, and she started telling everybody in the city what she had just experienced. She just experienced a man that knew everything about her but didn't judge her because of it. He didn't belittle her. He didn't make fun of her. He lifted her up. So all the people of Samaria came out, and they said, to, looked at Jesus and talked to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, why don't you stay with us for a couple more days? And this is what they said. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all the things I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed with them for about two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. There's times where we can be that testimony. There's times that God has called us and enabled us to get into people's lives, to minister to them, and to love them, but for a purpose. And that purpose is to let people see Christ in us. And once they have given their life to Christ, it is what they do with their faith. We were at Starbucks on Friday, uh, had a missionary, had lunch, and uh, we were just sitting talking about church and talking about God and talking about what God is doing and what our lives are, our ministries. And it was a neat experience. We were just talking. But sitting over on the right-hand corner, all the way back in the back, was this girl. And she was all by herself except for her and her Bible. And she was intense in reading her Bible. She was just going pay over there for 35, 40 minutes, and she was just reading her Bible. And we were just talking about her. Say, so, you know, we're talking about our faith. We're talking about what we want to do. And she isn't talking about what she's going to do. She wants to experience the one that changed her life. And I thought, she didn't say a word, but she spoke a sermon so loudly. She didn't care if somebody was walking into Starbucks and seeing her read her Bible. She was willing to give a testimony of her faith just by opening up the Bible and reading. We were preachers. We didn't have our Bibles with us. We were just talking away. But we learned a lesson. Sometimes it's better to be who God wants us to be than just to talk about God, what God wants us to do. 
So in our faith, in the brokenness of our life, have we come to a point where we have felt God's work within our life? Do we experience God's heartfelt need? What are those? Every one of us have four heartfelt needs. The first heartfelt need is acceptance. Knowing that you are loved for who you really are. That you are loved for who you really are. Not the mask, not the facade, but God loves you for who you really are. You know, when Jesus was walking to Samaria, I bet he walked past hundreds and thousands of individuals. But he had a divine appointment by God to meet this woman because she needed acceptance. She had no identity. She thought she was worthless. She had no hope. She tried everything that she could possibly do with any relationship that she's ever had. She's had husbands and husbands and husbands. And she said no to the husband thing. I'll just live with the guy. I don't care. I do not trust. She needed acceptance. Knowing that you are loved for who you really are. And then the second one is identity. Know that you are significant in who you are. Not that there's a purpose, but I have an identity. I know that it is a significant purpose within my life. And when I know that I'm accepted by God and God is going to use me, I have significance. I wake up in the morning knowing there's a purpose, knowing I can do something, knowing God can have me, knowing that God is going to put divine calls within my life, those points, those ministries, those opportunities to minister to others. Identity, we need to have that identity. And then security, knowing that everything's going to be all right. Knowing that I'm going to go through junk, and there's going to be stuff that happens every day. But with God's help, I know that I can get through this. You know, we're a church family, and a church family is supposed to be brothers and sisters in Christ. And when you had a church family, or I'm sorry, if you had your family, and somebody in your family is getting ready to go through a major ordeal, a major issue within your life, you would want to know about it. You'd want to pray for them. Well, we have a family in our church that this Thursday morning is going to go through a major, major ordeal. Uh, Kevin and Jennifer Self, uh, they're going to be, I'm sorry, Jessica and Kevin Self, they're going to go through a major ordeal. They're going to induce delivery with a little baby that's got major problems, major problems. And they have been preparing themselves for the last months with this and been praying with us. We've been going over all kinds of issues. We've been talking with them and praying with them. And it comes down to crunch time this Thursday. We've been praying with them and loving them and ministering to them. And as a church family, we can't change what's going to take place within their life. Only God can do that. But you know what, as a church family, is what we can do? Is we can lift them up. And we can have empathy for them. Because if we are going through something, we want people to stand up and lift them up and encourage us like we need to encourage others. So Thursday morning around 8 o'clock, Wednesday evening when they check in, I just ask you to lift them up. Lift them up in prayer. Asking God to work within their life. God can do great and mighty things within their life. But you know, whatever takes place, God's hand is going to be upon their life. And because of their security in Christ, they know that there's going to be tomorrow. They know it's going to be very difficult to go through, but they know that they can make it through, not only with God's help, but with family's help. That's what security is all about, knowing that tomorrow is going to be tough. But when I make the phone call, when I get the bad news, and I know that I'm not doing this by myself. I have God's help and God's direction within my life. So acceptance, identity, security, and then purpose. Knowing that there's a reason for my life. To wake up and know that there's a reason. This woman at the well was totally identified with her past. She, she would look at herself and she said, I was a failure. I failed in many different areas. But there's a point within her life that it went from her past to her future. And that point was Jesus. And there's a time where we have to say, I am not who I was. 
I am who I am, and the focal point of who I am is Jesus. So that is what I hold on to. And know that because of the focal point, because of my faith and my focus on Christ, I can make a difference. I can have purpose. I can do certain things. I believe there's a time when we need to start living on God's purpose instead of my own purpose. I listed a few that over the last few years in my journals, I listed a few things that I believe marks maturity. I fail at these all the time. But I believe when you're talking about living a life of purpose, when you look at the Samaritan woman, there was a time in her life where she said, enough is enough. God made a divine appointment with her. You may have had divine appointments within your life. There may be times where you say, I, I could not have made it if it wasn't for God intervening within my life. And sometimes we take that, a divine moment, and we accept that divine moment, and then we forget what God has done. I'm saying what we need to do is remember what God has done and use it as a catalyst to make us who God wants us to be in the future. Don't forget, don't put it on coast mode. Let's say, if I have a purpose, if God has a plan, if I look at God in my heartfelt need and God brought somebody alongside me to help me in the future, what does it look like? And then here's what I put down. Number one, let my ambitions create a, never let my ambitions create false self-impressions to others. In other words, I do not want to live a lie. I want my brokenness and my heartfelt needs to be able to minister to others and I do not want to put on a mask and play the game of church or play the game of Christianity. And so often the churches are full of fake, hypocritical church members because they do not understand what faith and forgiveness is all about. And if I can look like the Samaritan woman and I can say, my faith is my future, my past is behind me, and I want to be who I am. I am not known by my past. I am known by who I believe. Always be real and transparent. Always be real. Don't be hypocritical. Don't be fake. Be genuine. And then root yourself in an untamable love of God. An untamable. In other words, in any circumstance, in any scenario, just let God be real within your life. Decide what you're going to do and live your life for God. Seek him first and let him handle the lesser things of life. Seek God. And this, little, this little girl sitting at Starbucks, I, you've probably done this, but the greatest testimony was not that she was standing on the street corner preaching the Bible. It wasn't that she was going in and passing out tracts to everybody. She didn't say a word to anybody. But she spoke volumes of what she did. She was reading and trying to be hungry to learn what God wants her to do. Spoke volumes. So we need to root ourselves in an untamable love for God. And we are to pursue our calling, make excellence a top priority. God deserves our best. Not just our leftovers. We're talking about our life. God deserves our best. I had, we were talking with some friends last night about the way that people address each other. And whether they're teachers, they're called Mr. and Mrs. and their last name. They just, they, they desire and they want those students to understand respect. And I believe that's the way that we should respect the things of God. We should honor. We should lift up the Lord our God. He is our Lord, which means our highest calling, our preeminent one. When we look at God, do we respect God? If we respect God, if he is our Lord and Savior, if he is our Lord, that means the highest one. We should honor and respect him, making him a highest calling. And if he is a high calling, do we put honor and excellence and what he does. Is our faith honored? Is our, is our worship honoring? Do we put him 
where he needs to be. He deserves our best. Now, back in the old days, you know, 30, 40 years ago, uh, you would, our best it would be our dress. As long as, if we're dressed up, if I have my coat and tie on and I, and I look good, that's my best. Because people associated being your best by what you look. If I look like I'm professional, if I look like I'm putting on my best, that I must be spiritual. Well, I believe when you're talking about putting on our best, I'm talking a spiritual best. I'm saying be who you are. It's not about the outward professions. It's not about the way we look. It's are we spiritually at our best? When we wake up in the morning, are we spiritually at our best? Do we honor him or do we put our life on coast mode? We are to pursue a calling of excellence at a top priority. Be who God has called us to be. And let your convictions and your principles steady you. Let your convictions and your principles steady you. Hold on to your integrity, disciplines, and the most important, your humility. We cannot become arrogant in what God has given to us. We have to always remember that who we are, remember where we came from, and remember because of where I came from, because of my heartfelt needs, because I am a broken individual, because I do make a lot of mistakes, because God does love me no matter what I do, I can look at him and I can say, I can do things. I can let my convictions and my principles steady me because I need to hold on to my integrity and disciplines and most important, my humility. Knowing that I have to have something to stand for. What do I stand for? What, what do I hold on to? If we, we look at the, the ebb and flow of life, what is it that's absolute? What, what, what is it that I, what I would die for? What is it that, that I love? And if I don't have something that I will die for, that I will hold on to, what, what do I do? I'm worried every day that I'm going to lose something. I have no security. I have no hope. But if I look at, I am going to live my life to honor God. I have security in my convictions and my priorities. Is number one, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And in doing so, I can have faith and I can bring others along with me. I need to have those convictions and those principles and those priorities within my life that I will hold on to. And I believe those things were to be biblical. And then, when stress runs high and difficulties arise, remember that God is on your side and a better tomorrow is possible. When difficulties arise, when problems happen, when issues are overwhelming in our eyes, when I have a faith in God, I know that tomorrow can be better. It may not be perfect. The selves may go through a, a valley that they don't want to go through, but their faith in Christ will allow them to know that God is with me through the valleys. We've all been through major issues, and we've all been broken to a point that we've had to stand before God and say, God, I need your help. And God does what God can only do. He supernaturally brings people around us and in our life to lift us up, to give us comfort, and to give us hope. We couldn't make it without it. And as a family, as a church, we have to understand when stress runs high and difficulties arise, that's when you are called by God to be the child of God to look and to minister, to open up your hearts and to understand these heartfelt needs that others have. They need purpose. They need security. They need some hope. When we can come alongside them and help them, it allows the stress of their life and the difficulties that are at a high level to be shared. And here's the key. Before we can do what God wants us to do, we have to release from what we've always done. We can't hold on to our past and go to where God wants us to go. It cannot happen. So when, if I want to be what God wants me to be, if I want to go where God wants me to go, I have to, on purpose, release my past and embrace my faith. It's very difficult to do because we know what this is like. We may not like it. We may struggle with it. 
It may hinder us, but we're comfortable because we know it. And if I have to release this, and I have to turn my back to what I know, it's very unsettling. But we'll never go to where God wants us to go into the future in our faith until we release what we're comfortable with. And sometimes the thing that we're most comfortable with is hindering us from doing what God wants us to do. What is it? What is it that we hold on to? What is it that's keeping you from doing what God wants you to do? What is it if you were that woman at the well and you're holding on and you have a divine moment with God that God is trying to change your life and you're holding on to it and you won't let go of it and God is pleading within your life and saying, I'm trying to give you a, a, a water that's going to get rid of the thirst and the pain and the agony. And you say, I don't want the water. I'm happy. I like what I'm doing. And God, over and over and over, will give you divine opportunity upon divine opportunity. But we have to make that choice ourselves. The Bible says right here that after Jesus met with them for two days, they didn't have their faith in Christ because what she said. They had their faith in Christ because of who he was. Because Jesus encountered them. There's a point within our life that our testimony is good. And we should share our faith. We should communicate what God is doing within our life. But we cannot take ownership of somebody else's faith. They have to have faith on themselves. There has to be a point that every one of us have to release what's holding us back and turn our faith on Christ. We can talk to them, we can share with them, we can love them, we can minister to them, but each and every one of us must have a divine appointment from God and release the thing that's holding us back to experience in faith with Christ. And they experienced that. For two days, Jesus ministered to them, and many more people came to know Christ because of his words and because of his life. And I like this last one. We need to br build bridges not walls with those around us. Build bridges, not walls. You need others to be who God wants you to become. You cannot grow on your own. Sometimes we put up walls. Put up walls to a point that we don't want people to know. We don't want people to know what we're going through. You know, we, <laughs> it's a stupid little illustration, but it happens all the time. We get a phone call from somebody in the hospital. Say, oh, we had surgery last Thursday or somebody's gone through a major event and we didn't know. And I'd go up to see him. I said, why didn't you call? I said, oh, we didn't, we didn't want to bother you. We didn't, we didn't want the church to worry about it. I'm thinking, how can I minister to you if you build up that wall that I can't pray for you and the church can't come alongside you? Sometimes we need those bridges Sometimes you need somebody to come alongside. Sometimes we need to minister one to another. And sometimes those walls are because of our insecurities. And because of our insecurities, we put up walls so others can't get into our life and to minister to us and help us out. But true valued friendship and Christianity is I'm going to build a bridge over my own failures, my own faults, my own self-worth, and I'm going to have left that divine appointment that God brings to me with open eyes to realize just like the woman at the well, when I looked into his eyes, I saw myself as I truly am. I saw myself in his eyes, not mine. And when we look at who we truly are through God's eyes, we are not that self-arrogant, insecure failure that sometimes we think that we are. When we can see our eyes through God's eyes, we can see that I have a purpose, that I have a faith. We can see that tomorrow can be better. I can see that I am not called by my failures of my past I can be called by my faith in the future. But it all talks about the hinge. What was the defining moment in her life? That defining moment in her life was an unexpected moment. Many people would go early in the morning 
or late at night in the cool of the day to draw water. She went in the middle of the day, the hottest part of the day. Why? She was embarrassed. She didn't want the other ladies talking about her. She was called all kinds of names by all kinds of people because she was not living the right life. But God, I have to go to Samaria. Because there's somebody in Samaria that is struggling and hurting, and I have to meet her. In the weirdest part of the day, where she was not expecting to encounter, she encountered a life-changing transformation that God gave to her. In your life, in the worst part of your day, in the biggest insecurities of your life, in the failures, in the fears, and in insecurities. Can you see Christ? Has he come to you when nobody else will? When you feel like there's no hope? Can you look at your past and say, you know what? I can be forgiven. I can be forgiven of everything that I've ever done. Jesus didn't wink at her sin. Jesus didn't say, yeah, that's all right, don't worry about it. He confronted her in her sin. He said, you've spoken right. You've been married five times, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. She was, how did you know this? Because God knows the innermost parts of our life. He knows the thing that you try to hide. He knows the thing that you try to cover up. He knows our heart. He knows our need. And he still loves us and wants to forgive us and to give us hope for the future. So the biggest hope that I can give to you is security. The heart felt need of acceptance. Knowing that you are loved for who you really are. Not for who you act like. And not for what you do, but for who you are. When Jesus looks at you, when God looks at you, he doesn't look at the clothes that you're wearing or the house that you live in or the car that you drive. He looks deeper than that, much more important than that. He looks to the soul. He looks at your core. He looks at who you are. And there's one thing that he wants to do more than anything else, and he wants to make that soul whole. He wants to make your life real. Not insecure, not down, not dead, not with any hope. He wants to heal the broken heart. And he can only heal the broken heart with that divine appointment of God. And when we meet God, what do we do with that moment? Do we listen? Do we hear? Do we try to understand? Or do we accept the faith, the healing? and the forgiveness and take it and share it with the world. That's our calling. That's our calling as Christians is to let the faith and the forgiveness that God has given to us to not stay with us to go into Samaria and tell everybody about this man that knew everything that I did and forgave me. They came out in droves they pleaded with him, come stay with us. We need to hear all about this. And when you are encountered by God, people will be attracted to what you have if it's genuine, if it's life-changing, if it's excellent, heart towards God. That's what our challenge is. A heartfelt needs, acceptance, our identity, our security, and our purpose. Until we come to Christ, knowing that I can't do anything without him, until we understand who I am, until we understand that there's a purpose, until I understand that I'm secure in Christ, we will live a life through the facade of other people's image. But once we see Christ, once we know what he's done for us, once we've been transformed and forgiven, we can look at God and say, I am who I am. I am a child of God, forgiven by God, and ready for the next stage of my life.
That's what we have to have. As we're talking about a healthy church, we have to have a church full of people that have a passion to let go of their past, let go of what's holding them back, and say yes to the things of God. What's holding you back will be different than what's holding me back. But God knows what our hinge is. He knows what's anchoring us to the bottom of the floor. And we have to say no to the things that's keeping us from doing what God wants us to do. What is yours? What is mine? I make a list every day. And I have to ask God to give me hope and give me strength because I let go of it today and you know what I find myself doing? Going right back at to it tomorrow. I find myself holding on to that Sometimes I need to let go of it every day and every day it gets harder to let go of it because I don't know what tomorrow has in store. But if my trust and my faith is in Christ, the longer I let him take control of my life, the easier it is to walk away from what's holding me back. Sooner or later, God will give me enough security, enough strength to say, that's not what I want anymore. I want faith. I want Christ. I need him. Just like the woman at the well, she ran away from her needs into a city to talk about her Savior. Changed her life forever. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, just like the woman at the well, she had so many needs, so many insecurities, and so many failures. But Lord, just like you do, you forgave her, just like what you did for us. And Lord, we thank you for that forgiveness. Now, I, Lord, I pray that you'll transform us like you transformed her, that you'll give us hope in the future and not failures of our past. You'll give us the ability to change the world by talking about how you changed our lives, by willing to learn and to grow and to be so simple in our faith. Not argumentative, but just genuine. Change our heart, O oh Lord. Make us who you want us to be because you love us unconditionally. And Lord, put upon our hearts, our lives, the ability to get into other people's lives. Lord, I pray you'll be with Jessica and Kevin. I pray that your hand will be upon them this week and you'll give them strength to endure hope for the future, security for the present, and love of others to endure whatever is in store. We love them. We need you to allow us to minister to them properly, just like we all need, in time of our need, your hope and your love. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Pastor Al.